This is The Arm of the Starfish by Madeline Engel. Chapter 22. It was Joshua. Muito obrigado, he said to, the, to Adam's driver. Apresse se. Clapped him in a swift, comradely gesture on the shoulder and turned to Adam. The young driver ran back to his cab. They heard him gun the engine and roar down the street. Joshua pulled a key out of his pocket and bent to unlock the gate. How did you know? Adam started. Callie phoned me. How did she get my numbers? The gate creaked open. Joshua pulled Adam through, clanged it shut, locked it. When Adam did not answer his question, he did not repeat it. They hurried down the path, brushed by early evening shadows, cast by tall hedges. Behind them, they could hear the squeal of tires, screech of brakes, slamming of car doors. Run! Joshua sprinted ahead, Adam close on his heels. The path turned, leading them to an arched side entrance. Again, Joshua bent to the lock. As the door swung open, they could hear footsteps pounding down the path. Joshua slammed the door and leaned against it for a moment, panting. Are the papers still on you? Yes. Behind them, there was a pounding at the door. Joshua pulled Adam away as shots rang out, splintering the heavy wood. Quick! The room they were in was so deep in shadows that Adam could see nothing after the light outside. Joshua grabbed his hand and they ran. Adam, stumbling, slowing them down, ran through the room, through the corridor, illuminated by high, dusty windows, and then out and into the light of the cloister. In the center of the garden, the fountain rose high, catching the long rays of sun in a shower of silver. They ran, pounding down the echoing stones. Their footsteps echoed, and the echo was lost in the crash of heavy feet, seeming to close in from all sides. Ahead of them, a hulking form loomed up. Molech. God, Joshua said. He swung Adam around and shoved him into one of the monk's niches as a shot rang out. Still running, Joshua fell. Out of the niche became, beside Adam came Typhon Cutter, and Callie ran swiftly along the cloister and plummeted into his arms. Well done, Typhon Cutter said, and Adam saw, with a feeling of nausea, the look of adoration she gave her father the spider weaving his inex inexorable, inexorable web in which they were all trapped. How now was there any escaping, escaping the tightening threads? Despair burned in the pit of Adam's stomach, then burst into a fierce and controlled anger such as, as he had never felt before. He stood crouched like a panther, ready to spring. Another shot. The gun dropped from Molech's hand, and he gave a scream of rage and pain. Another shot dropped him, writhing to his knees. Typhon Cutter pulled Callie back into the monk's cell. Joshua lay, without moving, on the stones a few feet from Adam. Stay back, a voice catapulted across the cloister as Adam started to leap out of the niche into which Joshua had shoved him. He had no weapon, no gun. He could not help, only hinder. There was, at the moment, nothing to do but obey. Across the cloister, he saw the dark form of Canon Talus, smoking gun in hand. He thought he saw Archangelo. A shot rang across the cloister from Typhon Cutter cell and ricocheted from a stone column. Adam looked at Joshua's still form, only a shadow as light began to withdraw from the cloister and let out a cry of anguish and rage. His cry was echoed in the high shriek of a siren. Turning, he saw Typhon Cutter and Callie slip out of their cell. As they disappeared into the darkening corridor, he was after them, and with one leap, he flung himself on Mr. Cutter, throwing him to the ground. Daddy, don't kill him! Callie screamed. Adam's fingers clamped around the wrist that held the gun. On his knee was the bloated, his knee was on the bloated stomach. 
No, Callie said. No. She grabbed the gun from her father and pointing it, pointed it quaveringly at Adam. He could barely see the gun because the passage was almost entirely locked in darkness. The light filtering dustily through the high windows was above their heads, and they were enclosed in shadows. Let him up, Callie ordered. Adam looked toward her. In the dim light, her face was contorted in a horrible mixture of emotion. If she had ever been beautiful for him, she was not beautiful now. Let him up, she said again, her voice steadier, or I'll shoot. I mean it. Adam lifted his knee from the belly, released his hold on the wrist. Typhoon Cutter struggled to his feet as a searchlight swept across the cloister, penetrating the dark reaches of the corridor where the three of them stood, panting. The papers, Typhoon Cutter said. I gave you the papers. Not those. You have others. Give them to me. The treble voice soared. No, Adam said. I don't have any papers. The gun, Callie. No, Daddy, no. If he shouted, Adam thought, they might hear him in the cloister and come. But no sound emerged from his constricted throat. The gun... The muzzle pressed against Adam's chest. The papers. Go ahead and shoot, Adam croaked. For all the good it will do you. He expected to hear the explosion of the bullet, if, indeed, he heard anything. But Cutter said, Callie. And the boy felt, instead of the deadly burst of lead, her long fingers moving over him, coming closer as she searched to Maria's pocket. Without conscious volition, his hand flashed out and slapped across the girl's face. The sound sharp and unexpected and immediately followed by a shot and a crash of the gun dropping from Typhoon Cutter's hand. The shot had not come from Cutter's gun. From where? Cutter began to back down the passage. holding Callie in front of him as a shield. Through the darkness came the voice of Arganhalo. Let them go, my men outside. Adam reached down in the shadows to look for the dropped gun, but he could not find it. His breath came in painful gasps as his heart thudded against the ribcage. Come, Arganhalo said. It's over. Everything is over. Come. The searchlight swung around again, and Adam moved toward it and to the cloister that had, that still contained the last rays of the sun, the fountain glistening as it rose toward the sky, Joshua lying sprawled on cold stone. With an absolute carelessness and indifference to what was going on around him, Adam ran across the pavement to Joshua and knelt by him. Joshua's eyes were open but he did not see. Joshua, Adam cried, Joshua. He put his head against Joshua's chest, listening, listening, and thought he felt the faint thread of a heartbeat. He noticed two uniformed men going by with Malak bellowing on a stretcher, noticed it only because the sound kept him from listening for Joshua's heart. He pressed his cheek to Joshua's lips to try to feel the the faintest breath. Adam. It was Canon Tellus's voice. Adam looked up. The priest stood there, gun still in hand, with two uniformed policemen beside him. Adam could tell that the canon was thanking them and that he was giving them instructions. When they turned toward Joshua, he spoke to them brusquely, and they bowed and moved away. Get up, Canon Tellus said to Adam, and the boy stood. The canon knelt beside Joshua, a faint sound from his lips, the single word, God. It was also the last word Joshua had said. Out of the shadows, Arganhalo and Father Enriquez emerged, Arganhalo looming enormous beside the tiny priest. Canon Talus looked at them, morto, 
he said. No, Adam babbled. No, he's not dead. He can't be. He is dead. Be still, Ken and Talos said. He leaned over Joshua again, and it was as though the two of them had gone 2,000 miles away, that they were not in the cloister with Adam and Father Enriquez and Archon alone. The canon took Joshua into his arms, holding him close in a gesture of infinite tenderness and love. Father Enriquez touched Adam's arm and drew him away. The three of them, Father Enriquez, Arcangelo, Adam, walked slowly along the cold stones of the cloister, their feet muffled in darkness and grief, leaving Ken and Talus with Joshua. <laughs>